Alleluia. Thank you, Jesus, for the cross. Let us pray together. Heavenly Father, Lord, today is a good day. You are the same yesterday, today, and forever. The plans you have for us are not to harm us, but to prosper us, to give us hope to give us a future. You are the God of hope. Today, as we look at your word, Father, we pray that you fill us with joy, fill us with hope, comfort us in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Well, many of you are probably familiar with the comedian Bill Engvall. Bill Engvall is known as part of the Redneck Comedy Tour. He often tours with Jeff Foxworthy. But Jeff Ingvall, I'm sorry, Bill Ingvall is probably best known for a style of jokes where the punchline is, here's your sign. How many of you know who Bill Ingvall is? Quite a few hands going up. Well, Bill Ingvall, in this style of jokes where he says, here's your sign, the premise of these jokes is simply this. He describes a painfully obvious situation that is obvious to almost everybody except for one particular person who just for some reason or another does not get it. And so he says, here's your sign. And the sign he's referring to is a sign that they should be wearing that kind of indicates to everyone around them that they're perhaps not necessarily the sharpest knife in the drawer. As an example of what I mean, take a look at the video screens and see Bill Ingvall's comedy tour. Over these past several weeks, we've been a series of messages in the Gospel of John. And through this series, we have seen John give us sign after sign after sign. In John chapter 2, we read how Jesus turned water into wine. Here's your sign. If you've been doing your readings along with us, in chapter 4, toward the end of the chapter, Jesus heals the government official's son. Here's your sign. At the beginning of chapter 5, we read how Jesus has now healed the invalid in Bethesda. Here's your sign. And today, as we pick up our study of the book of John in chapter 6, we see another sign. And so if you brought Bibles with you today or if you're uh, tuning in online, we encourage you to follow along with your own Bible. In uh, John chapter 6, we'll also be here in the worship center projecting it up on the screens. But John chapter 6, we're going to read together looking at verse 1 through 14. After this, Jesus went to the other side of the Sea of Galilee also called the Sea of Tiberias. A large crowd kept following him because they saw the signs that he was doing for the sick. Jesus went up the mountain and sat down there with his disciples. Now the Passover, the festival of the Jews, was near. When the crowd looked up, when he looked up and saw a large crowd coming toward him, Jesus said to Philip, Where are we to buy bread for these people to eat? He said this to test him, for he himself knew what he was going to do. Philip answered him, Six months' wages would not buy enough bread for each of them to get a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, There is a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish. But what are they among so many people? Jesus said, make the people sit down. Now there was a great deal of grass in the place, so they sat down, about 5,000 in all. Then Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated, so also the fish, as much as they wanted. When they were satisfied, he told his disciples, gather up the fragments left over so that nothing may be lost. So they gathered them up. And from the fragments of the five barley loaves left by those who had eaten, they filled 12 baskets. When the people saw this sign that he had done, they began to say, this is indeed the prophet who is to come into the world. Here's your sign. Throughout these Gospels, we have seen these signs where Jesus turns water into wine, 
where Jesus heals people. And here we see again where Jesus performs another miracle where he heals, where, where he feeds 5,000 people. Here's your sign. And what is the sign? What are all these signs pointing to? All these signs are pointing to one specific thing, that Jesus is God, that Jesus is God in human flesh. You see, the book of John, John's gospel is not intended to be a biography of the life of Jesus. John's gospel was never intended, like the synoptic gospels, to be a narrative of Jesus' life. But rather, John's gospel is intended to be a specific argument trying to help us understand that Jesus is God in human flesh. Think about John chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the word, the word was with God, and the word was God. And then verse 14 tells us, and the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. Remember when grocery stores had food? <laughs> there was a can called chili con carne, right? And what is chili con carne? It's chili with meat, chili con carne. Well, the incarnation is God con carne, Dios con carne, God with meat. The incarnation is really God with flesh, God with meat. That's what the word incarnation means. And throughout John's gospel, what he's trying to prove to us in his arguments is that all these signs point to the very fact that Jesus is God, that Jesus is God in human flesh. Now, certainly there are skeptics, there are false teachers, there are liberal theologians who would like us to believe that Jesus is not God in human flesh. They don't dispute the fact that Jesus lived. They don't dispute the fact that Jesus of Nazareth is an actual historic figure that lived, that walked the earth. And they would concede that he was a great teacher, he was a great rabbi, but they would take issue with the fact that Jesus is God. As a matter of fact, if they were to teach on this very text here from John chapter 6, the feeding of the 5,000, what they would do is twist the scripture in ways to suggest that the only miracle that really occurred was that people shared with one another. And what they would suggest from this text is just because the boy is mentioned as one who had a lunch with him, just because he was identified as one who had food, that was just an example that everyone else there would have had food as well. And the real miracle was they shared with one another. I'm sorry, John 6 is not some liberal text advocating for socialism. The reality here is that Jesus is God and Jesus in human flesh performed a miracle. Jesus is God. Here's your sign. So what I want to do this morning is unpack John chapter 6, verses 1 through 14 together. And so as we consider the story of the feeding of the 5,000, there are three main characters that we're going to be looking at. And the first one, of course, first and foremost, is Jesus. The first character we see in this story is Jesus. Now, the story of the feeding of the 5,000 is a story that appears in all four of the Gospels. And so as we look at the other Gospels, we can gain some more insight. Because in Matthew's Gospel, what he identifies is just before the feeding of the 5,000, John the Baptist has just been beheaded now, this is rather significant because we recognize that Jesus certainly had a relationship with John the Baptist. And this relationship that Jesus had with John the Baptist actually was established even before he was born. In Luke's gospel, we read how Mary, when she was pregnant with Jesus, went to visit one of her relatives by the name of Elizabeth. And Elizabeth was pregnant at the time with John the Baptist. And in Luke's gospel, it's recorded that when Mary, who was pregnant, greeted Elizabeth, who was pregnant, the baby within Elizabeth's womb leaped for joy in the very presence of Jesus. And because they were relatives, I like to believe, although Scripture doesn't support this, that as children, they probably hung out together. They probably hung out, went to barbecues together. I can imagine Jesus uh, and, and John went down to the Sea of Galilee to go surfing. 
I imagine that John was probably wearing some strange swimsuit made of camel's hair, that Jesus was probably surfing out there without a surfboard. And you, you never, the Bible doesn't support that. I understand that. But what the Bible does support is this idea that before Jesus started his earthly ministry, we learn from Scripture that John was out in the wilderness preparing people the, for the way, preparing people for Jesus, that the way is coming, that Jesus is coming. And John makes the statement, John the Baptist makes the statement, that one who is coming, whose shoes I could never fill. And then we know from Scripture that when it was time for Jesus to be baptized, that it was John the Baptist who baptized Jesus. And so we begin to see the relationship between Jesus and John unfold. And so naturally, because Jesus is God in human flesh, yes, he's 100% God, but he is still 100% man. And because he is 100% man, he would have grieved the loss of his dear friend and relative, John the Baptist. And so in the text we read out of John 6, we learned that Jesus was withdrawing up into the mountains with his disciples. And I imagine the reason he did that was to grieve, was to be with those closest to him, to be comforted, to deal with the loss of a dear friend. And while they're there, Unfortunately, Jesus has not turned the GPS off on his phone. He has not put it on airplane mode or do not disturb. And so the crowds are able to find him. And so pretty soon the crowds all start, here he is, there's Jesus. And they all start gathering around Jesus. And what does Jesus do? He takes that opportunity to teach. And with all those people gathered around him, Jesus begins to teach. And his teaching goes on. And as he is teaching throughout the day, he realizes that the people near him must be hungry. And I think that is an important place for us to pause for a moment, to recognize that not only did Jesus feel and mourn and grieve the loss of a dear friend, but he also relates to us. Not only is he concerned about our spiritual welfare, but he's also interested in our physical well-being. Think about that especially at a time like this with the coronavirus upon us where there is so much fear. Jesus cares about our physical well-being. Jesus cares about how we are doing physically. He wants to provide food for us. He wants to provide a roof over our head, food for our cupboard, clothes for our kids, shoes for their feet. He cares about our physical needs. Look at how it's written in Ephesians chapter 4. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our infirmities. He relates to us. Jesus is a down-to-earth God who wants to connect with you in a relationship, not through religion. Religion doesn't work. The relationship Jesus has with you as God in human flesh to we as humans in flesh, God understands our conditions and what we're going through even today. The second person in our story is Andrew. Andrew is an interesting study. If you start looking at Andrew, Andrew appears to be rather insignificant throughout Scripture. He's only mentioned three times throughout the Gospels. Only three times. And when Andrew is mentioned, it's always interesting to note that he doesn't stand alone. They always put him in relationship to his brother, Simon Peter. So when you read the Scripture, it says, Andrew, comma, Simon Peter's brother, the brother of Simon Peter, comma, Andrew, every time he's mentioned in Scripture, he's connected to his brother, as if we would not know who he is if he's not connected to his brother. Let me illustrate. Take a look at the video screen. Who is this? Any clue? His name is Doug. Does anyone know who Doug is? What if I told you this is Doug, comma, the brother of Brad Pitt? Oh, well, now I know who Doug is. Doug's the brother of Brad Pitt, because we all know who Brad Pitt is, right? Brad Pitt was married to Jennifer Aniston and Angelina Jolie. Not too bad. B uh, Brad Pitt is one who has won a lot of awards, started in Fight Club. You know, he's, he's a famous actor. He's a rock star. He's a celebrity. We all know who Brad Pitt is, don't we? 
And so when we look at this other guy, we're like, who is that? Oh, that's Brad Pitt's brother. Well, now I know who he is. You just put it into context for me. Doug, comma, the brother of Brad Pitt. Well, in the same way, we see in Scripture that Andrew is referenced as the brother of Simon Peter, the celebrity, the rock star. Because Simon Peter was thought to be the leader of all the disciples. Simon Peter is the one who Jesus looked at and said, Simon Peter, I'm going to change your name to the rock, and upon you I will build my church. And even today, the Roman Catholic Church looks at Simon Peter as the beginning of the unbroken succession to the Pope today. He's a rock star. He's a celebrity. And so, of course, we connect him. Oh, that's Andrew. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's Simon Peter's brother. That's a big deal. But I would suggest to you today that Simon Peter is a big deal, yes, but so is Andrew. That Andrew, in and of himself, is a very significant Bible person. He's a very significant character in this story and in all the stories, all three times he's mentioned. Because all three times he's mentioned in chapter 1, Andrew is bringing his brother, Simon Peter, to Jesus. In our story today, in chapter 6, we hear that Andrew is bringing the boy to Jesus, the boy who has the food. Andrew is the one bringing him to Jesus. And then we fast forward to chapter 12, and we see that there are a bunch of Greek people in the area. And what does Andrew do? He brings them to Jesus. You see, that was his job, his J-O-B, his job was to bring people to Jesus. My dad, who's watching online right now, when he was a pastor at Morningside Reformed Church in Sioux City, Iowa, they had a van. They had an old church van, and the church van's name was Andy the Van, because Andy the Van, Andrew the Van, had a job. What was his job? To bring people to church, to bring people to Jesus. I think if I were going to be remembered, I can't think of a better way to be remembered, even if it's only in three conversations after I'm gone, to be remembered as, yeah, that Jim, he was all about bringing people to Jesus. What about you? Could that be said about you? Are you driving your Andy the Audi and picking people up to, to church? Your Andy the SUV, your Andy the Tesla, whatever it is, are you, are you bringing people to Jesus? Hal Seed, Dr. Hal Seed was with us last weekend here at Mount of Olives Church when we did our Weekend in the Word. And Dr. Seed talked about the fact that there is no better time to invite people to church than Easter Sunday. He even made the statement that it's un-American not to go to church on Easter. And when we begin to recognize that there are people who are looking for a place to go to church on Sundays, what better way to start the conversation than to say, hey, where are you going to church on Sunday? Assuming we're able to gather together on Easter Sunday, I want to encourage you to think about Andy the Van, Andrew, to think about the importance of bringing people with you to church. And if we can't gather and assemble because of this coronavirus, what are the opportunities within your daily context where you can bring people into that relationship with Jesus to share a message of hope in such a desperate time of need? There are people around us who are hurting, who are suffering, who have fear. And there is no better time than to recognize where our culture is and to look for opportunities to bring people to Jesus. That's what we see here with Andrew. The third character in our story today is one of my favorite people in the Bible, and that's the boy. I love how the boy is represented in this story he becomes aware that there is need. And the disciples are walking around going, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? If only we had more food. If only we had more money. But the boy doesn't say, if only. The boy says, mister, I, I, I have my lunch you know, in my Davy and Goliath lunch pail. You know, I have a couple pieces of fish and a few loaves of bread. Can you use it? Can you use the meager contents of my lunchbox? 
Can you use what I have, mister? I mean, think about that. How many of us play the what if game? Or the only if? Only if I had more time, then I would volunteer. Only if I had more money, then I would help people out. Only if I were older, only if I were better educated, if only I had fill in the blanks. I think we all struggle with this if only mentality. This if only, if only I had this, if only I had that, if only I had better resources, then I could be available. Then God could use me. But that's not what the boy says. The example we see in scripture of this boy is he's saying, take the meager contents of my lunchbox. Take what little I have and use it. And what does Jesus do? He used it all right. From the contents of that little boy's lunchbox, he was able to feed 5,000 people. And technically, it would have been more than 5,000 people because in those days, in the Bible days, they only counted the men that were present. And obviously, there was a boy present as well. And so if there were that boy present, there were likely many other children present. And goes to reason, if the boys and the kids were present, then certainly the women would be present. And so instead of 5,000 people, maybe it was 10,000. Maybe it was 15, possibly 20. Think about that. That not only is Jesus able to feed perhaps 20,000 people with two pieces of fish, five little loaves of bread, but our text tells us that there was plenty left over, that there was 12 baskets of food left over, 12 baskets of food. Did you ever wonder what they did with the leftovers? I did. And so I started reading, and some of the commentaries suggest that the disciples kept all 12 baskets so that they could help other people, that they could take care of the needy. But I like to imagine that maybe Jesus, in taking the boy's lunchbox, gave the boy the leftovers from his lunch. Just imagine what that story might sound like. Here you have the boy stringing all 12 baskets of, them, of, of the bread together and dragging them home. And, and he gets home, Mom, 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 you'll never guess what happened. He runs in the house and says, Mom, Mom, you know that Mr. Jesus guy? Mom, I saw the Mr. Jesus guy, and guess what I did? I gave him my lunch. And can you imagine Mom's response? Oh, son, son, when you left the house this morning, I told you not to lose your lunch. I told you to be careful, and you gave it away. Son, I told you that was all we had left. Son, what are we going to do now? Mom, Mom, I got it. I got this covered. Look what Mr. Jesus did. Come outside. Come outside. Mom, Mom, look at this. Look what Mr. Jesus did. He took, he took my lunch, and look what he did for us. Look what he did for me. We've got plenty. We're not going to go hungry. We can, we can eat for days, for weeks. We can take care of our neighbors. We can take care of our families. We can take care of the people in this community. Mom, mom, isn't this, isn't this great? I don't know that it really happened that way, but I think it fits within God's character. Look at this passage from Luke. Give and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, and shaken together, and running over. Pretty amazing. In this time of Lent, these 40 days that we use to prepare for Easter, that coincide with the 40 days that Jesus spent in the desert preparing for his earthly ministry, we begin to see through John's gospel all the signs the signs that tell us Jesus is God. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, Lord, as we gather here today, Father, would you remind us that you are here, that you are a down-to-earth God who knows us, who loves us, who's provided for us, that your word gives us hope, the plans, declares the Lord, are not to harm us, but to prosper us, to give us hope, to give us a future. 
You are the same yesterday, today, and forever. The cross proves you have overcome all. And so today, Father, we come before you with hearts filled with gratitude. Take what we have, use it for good and for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen.